Hello and welcome to Daily Current Affairs in the new IAS. Today is 4th September 2019 and the topics for discussion are Samudrayan project, AH-64E Apache helicopters, bank recapitalization, map aided program and previous year question revision series. Now coming to our first topic which is the Samudrayan project. Now this is the news because India wants to join a club of these uh, developed nations which can uh, you know un perform underwater ocean bed studies and it plans to do that with the Samudrayan project. Now we'll talk about the project a little bit. The Samudrayan is part of the Ministry of Earth, Sci Earth Sciences pilot project. It's a pilot project by Ministry of Earth Sciences and it is for the deep ocean mining for rare minerals. The project proposes to send a submersible vehicle with three persons to a depth of 600 meters. Understand 600 meters is basically six kilometers to carry out underwater studies. Now this is important, uh, this area is important because as of now all the submarines also that we have can only go to a depth of 200 to 300 meters underwater. And here is uh, one uh, machine that we are trying to make, a submersible vehicle that we are trying to make which has the capability to go down at least 6 kilometers down to the ocean bed and from there carry out uh, the studies that it has to do. Now uh, the National Institute of Ocean Technology, NEOT, that's in Chennai has undertaken Mission Samudrayan and is expected to become a reality by 2021-22. Now understand the successes of this uh, Samudrayan mission will help India join the League of Developed Nations in exploration of minerals from the ocean. Now Samudrayan is part of a deep sea mining project now for which we are currently using a vessel called Sagar Nidhi. Now this vessel is used because it can stay at one place for a very long time. So after, because it can stay at one place for a very long time, it has high fuel efficiency obviously. Moreover, because of that uh, stationary location on, uh, on the water, there is lot of time for the scientists to conduct underwater uh, studies or researches. Now coming to our next topic which is the AH-64E Apache helicopters. This is a very exciting news as far as India is concerned. Now this is a news because the Indian Air Force has inducted 8 Apache helicopters under its own wings. So, Apache helicopters has finally become a part of the Indian Air Force. Now, we'll talk about the helicopter. Now, this helicopter that is the AH-64E Apache helicopters is the world's most advanced multi-role heavy helicopter. Multi-role heavy attack helicopter. Okay. And it is flown by the US Army. Not the US Air Force, but the US Army. Okay. Now, the Apache helicopters are being purchased by India to replace the Mi-35 fleet of India. Actually, the Mi-35 fleet, which is basically Russian made, has become a little old for uh, the Indian Air Force's capabilities and other operations. So, therefore, to replace that, they, we are bringing in the Apache helicopters. Now, it has the capability to fire, uh, you know, sh fire and forget anti-tank guided missiles, air-to-air -air missiles, rockets and other ammunitions. In addition to all of that, it also has the capacity to uh, conduct, you know, electronic warfare. Now, because it is doing electronic warfare also, it becomes a very versatile helicopter in itself. So, it can add support to the ground troops. Also, it can carry out operations on its own. Now, India is the 16th, 16th nation in the world to select Apache and the AH-64E is the most advanced variant of this helicopter which is currently there in the world. Now, understand this is the only available combat helicopter in the world with a spectrum of capabilities for virtually any mission requirement. That is why India is actually acquiring this also. Because of its versatility, it can be used in any operation in any conditions. It is that strong and versatile and this is the reason why India is actually acquiring these helicopters. Now understand this helicopter is capable of delivering a variety of weapons. Now that includes air to, air to ground hellfire missiles, 70 mm, you know 70 millimeter Hydra, rockets, air-to-air -air stringer missiles, all those variety of missiles can also be fitted into these heli this helicopter and can be fired successfully. Now the Apache also carries one 30 millimeter chain gun with 1200 rounds and to add even more le you know le lethality for this helicopter it can also fire control radar. Now it has a 360 degree coverage and also has a nose mounted sensor suit for ta target acquisition and night vision systems. Basically speaking, it can be used in any operation 
is because of all its technic technical uh, advantages that it has and all the capacity of all the type of, uh, you know, majority of the type of advanced weaponry that it can carry on itself and then go on and continue with the mission. Now, they are operational both at uh, day and night. There is no time boundation with respect to this helicopter. Usually in the old helicopters, there was a restriction that it, only a few helicopters could be used, you know, at night time also. But here, it can be used at both times because even if it's day or night, because it has night vision cap capacities, capabilities are there in the Apache helicopters. So, it is operational in both day and night. It is all weather capable, any weather, any climate you put it, it will work, has high agility. It can move very quickly. You know, it is not very uh, sluggard in with respect to its movement. So, if this helicopter is also under attack, it can escape those attacks with agile movement. And even more after that, it has a very high survivability. Meaning, even after a few attacks are there, it can still carry on with its mission. It does not have to, you know, abort the mission because of the survivability of this helicopter is very high. So, these are the reasons why it becomes a very important uh, helicopter for the Indian Air Force. Now, moreover, it is also easily maintainable even in field conditions and has capacity for prolonged operation in tropical and desert conditions. So, basically, in every region possible, this helicopter can be used and successfully operated. Coming to the next topic, which is the bank recapitalization. Now, this is the news because the Union Cabinet, which is chaired by our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi, has approved the infusion of Rs. 4,557 crores by the Government of India into the IDBI Bank. Okay, so we'll uh, just, I'll just tell you a little bit about this. Now, following the Cabinet's approval by the Prime Minister, the Cabinet uh, which sat here, this was done in August of 2018. Okay, after that, LIC had acquired 51% stake in IDBI and the rest, uh, you know, Government became a promoter and then after that 46.46% uh, of stake was taken up by the government. Now the Reserve Bank of India had uh, reclassified IDBI Bank. Now the re reclassified IDBI Bank because after the LIC ac acquiring 51% of this bank, it had reclassified this bank as a private sector lender for regulatory purposes. Understand? So it became a private sector lender for regulatory purposes for, um, by the Reserve Bank of India. Now, the capital for the recapitalization has to come from its shareholders. Now, of the 9,300 crore needed, LIC would meet 51%. Now, that is 4,743 crores. The remaining 49% amounting to 4,557 crores is given by the government and that is what the government has recently done. Now, after this infusion, the IDBI bank expects to be able to subsequently raise further capital on its own and expects to come out of RBI's prompt corrective action. You understand uh, RBI had put its PCA, the prompt corrective action framework on, on it. Uh, therefore, it comes under regulatory, all the regulatory issues which are there under the banking system will also be looked into by the RBI uh, into the IDBI bank. Now, once it starts to make profit on its own after this capital infusion, the PCA, the prompt corrective action uh, regulations will be taken away on the IDBI, from the IDBI by next year. Now, basically, this cash neutral infusion will be through recapitalization bonds. So, and we'll talk about recapitalization bonds later on. So, we'll actually talk about bank recapitalization. Now, you know, bank recapitalization, as the name suggests, basically, is recapitalizing the bank with new capital and to improve their balance sheet. Now, since the government is the biggest shareholder in public sector banks, the responsibility of infusing capital major, majorly lies with the government. Now, the recapitalization recapital, plan comes into action when the bank gets caught in a situation where their liabilities are comparatively higher than their assets. Now, as I told you, uh, we will talk about recapitalization bonds. Now, any bond issued for the purpose of recapitalization of any entity is what you call recapitalization bonds. Now, how does recapitalization bonds work? Now, it works is that uh, the government will issue this, these recap bonds or recapitalization bonds, which banks will subscribe and enter it as an investment into their own books. Now, the banks will lend money to the government for subscribing these bonds. Now, this money is raised by the governments through these bonds and will go back to the banks as capital. 
this will immediately strengthen the balance sheet of the banks and show capital adequacy. Now since the government is always solvent, the money lent to the government for subscribing recapitalization bonds is free from becoming a bad loan. So this is how recapitalization bonds work. Okay, now coming to the MAP aided program, today we will be talking about a tiger reserve in Kerala. This is the Periyar Tiger Reserve. Now uh, as you can see the location of the Periyar Tiger Reserve here, we will talk about that. Now the Periyar Tiger Reserve was actually declared a sanctuary in 1950 and later on in 1978 only it was declared as a tiger reserve. Now the temperature in the Periyar Tiger Reserve ranges from 15 degrees Celsius to 31 degrees Celsius. Now there the average rainfall in the reserve is around 1700 millimeters. So you know since it's at an altitude it will have a variation and it's basically there is a lowering of temperature till 15 degrees Celsius. But since it's also in the equator, you know, in the tropical region during summers, it can the temperatures can raise up to 31 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now the it has an altitude ranging from 900 meters to 2,000 meters. So basically, it's on the Western Ghat region only. Now the highest peak in the Periyar Tiger Reserve is the Kottamala. Kottamala is the highest peak in the Periyar Tiger Reserve, and it has a height of 2,016 meters. Now the reserve is drained by two major rivers which is the Mulayar and the Periyar. So basically this Periyar Tiger Reserve comes from the name of one of the rivers that flows through it which is the Periyar River. Now the other river was what I told you was the Mulayar River. Now these two are the main rivers that drains the reserve. Along with that there are many streams also which actually drain the reserve. Now the forest type includes a tropical evergreen forest, tropical semi evergreen forest moist deciduous forest, grants lands. In addition to that, there are also eucalyptus plantations. Okay, now just keep in mind where the Periyar uh, Tiger Reserve is located. It is located in Kerala on the bordering with Tamil Nadu. Now coming to the previous year question revision series, I will read out the question. I need you to answer this in the comment section below. Okay, now the westerlies in the southern hemisphere are stronger and more persistent than in the northern hemisphere. Why? Statement 1. Southern Hemisphere has less landmass as compared to the Northern Hemisphere. Second, Coriolis force is higher in Southern Hemisphere as compared to the Northern Hemisphere. So think about the answer and write it down in the comment section below. And uh, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any doubts or queries, you can write down in the comment section below. Thank you.